of guest is the practice of shops putting a say 34 inch label on a pair of trousers that are really 36 inches so that people can feel slimmer than they really are. With the help of a tailor of the Savile Row tradition I tried on a number of jeans to find out if vanity sizing was an issue seeming British trousers too. Now, should yeah. I be breathing in, breathing no, out? No, just, just stand naturally here. You're going to need a 36. This pair of trousers I'm wearing, I'm told by the shop, is a 34 inch. You know, I don't usually have to struggle to do the buttons yeah. up. This is a tape measure. Yeah. Right. And if we put that round you... Well, well I believe you, the tape measure and, doesn't lie. And if we pull that in, that's 34, and that's I think you're going to be uncomfortable with that. That's a little, there's a bit of a bulge. After trying on several pairs of jeans, the ones that fit were 36 inches around the waist, but they were labelled as 34. John the tailor thought it had more to do with the fashion of jeans of the time to sit further down on your hips. Well, maybe. Anyway, today we're turning our attention to women's clothes sizes. Beth Sagar Fenton, our reporter, is here to tell us more. Now, Beth, I am currently wearing trousers labelled as having a 32-inch waist and a 34-inch inside leg in a stretch cotton because I refuse to compromise on style or comfort, but our previous investigation showed that this probably doesn't actually tell you anything about what you might learn from taking a tape measure to the lower half of my body. So... Is it the same story with women's clothes too? Before we get started, I think I need to explain women's clothes sizes here in the UK. There are very few brands or shops that size women's trousers by waist or leg measurements. Instead, most women's clothes use UK dress sizes. That means whether it's a jumper, shirt, dress, jeans, whatever, they're using a scale. The most common smallest size is eight, with sizes getting bigger, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, etc., etc. Okay, but what do they represent? What, what are the dimensions of a size eight, for example? Is it, is it like horses, you know, eight hands high? Well, that's just it. Where on earth does this sizing system come from? Clothes sizing seems to vary wildly from shop to shop. I know that no matter what, I'm going to have to try them on. I'm not going to be able to just go up to a hammer and say, yep, size 12, I'll have that. Yeah, every shop I go to, I'm a different size. Like, for some reason, every shop varies. But why? Thankfully, Dr Vicky Huffenden from the University of Brighton saved me from a rhetorical question spiral by actually knowing the answers. She began by reminding us that they are a comparatively new invention. In the 1800s, it was all tailoring. Most clothing was custom made by tailors or dressmakers who used their own systems of sizing. Clothes were made at home and then more ready-to-wear clothing began to be made. But still, it was being adapted to fit. So in the 1840s, for example, you had department stores, mail order companies opened in the 1870s. They all relied much more on alterations to customise fit to customers' needs that was included in the price. So they would have a workshop. Yeah, they would have a seamstress there who would take measurements and change it for you. Possibly the biggest coup en shock was the rationing of clothes. Little Willie's trousers may have been cut down, but a woman's dress. Well, of course, the number of coupons for this and that became the problem of the moment. It was the Second World War that changed things completely. For eight years, clothes were subject to tight rationing, meaning women were only able to get a few new items every year. Until there was some good news from the then president of the Board of Trade, Harold Wilson. I have just come here straight from the House of Commons, where I have just announced the ending of the clothing rationing scheme. Suddenly, the government wanted to encourage women to go shopping. In the 1950s, the Board of Trade commissioned a survey of women's sizes, which actually took women's measurements, the first real sort of UK sizing survey. Thousands of women were surveyed and measured in astonishing detail, but there was a bit of a problem. Well, the Board of Trade suggested that 126 sizes would be needed to cater for 98% of the adult female population, which of course is a huge range of sizes. Ah, shops were never going to go along with such an unwieldy plan. 126 sizes! Just imagine the length of the rails! Instead, the British Standards Institution set out a sizing standard in 1963. It looks familiar. It starts at a size 8 and goes up. And it's all based on hip and bust sizes. For example, a size 16 would fit women with hips between 39 and 41 inches and a bust of 37 to 39 inches. 
what you were supposed to do if, say, your hips fitted in a size 16, but your bust was 45 inches, doesn't actually say. But at least that all sounds pretty scientific. The size in the label tells you exactly what the measurements of the clothes will be. If only it were as easy as that now. I'm a size 8, and last time I went to Topshop, I had a try on a size 12 and 10 trousers. Sound familiar? Different shops will have a different, you know, they might say a size 14, but it will mean a different thing because they will have uh, a different waist measurement and a different value between the bust and the waist and the hip measurements. So they will be different proportions. Since the 1960s, shops have been tweaking the old official measurements. Dr Huffenden says this is due in part to vanity sizing, but they also have their own target customers with different average body shapes. I suppose shops would, would change their fitting depending if they were catering for an older market or a sporty market. You've got the, the shops that cater for teenagers. So how do they scientifically work out what would suit their different audiences? More rigorous large-scale surveys? Not quite. Hi, I'm Megan Taylor. I am a fit model. Clothes are made on me and I'm a size 8. The designers choose an actual real-life woman, usually a size 8 or 10, who looks like their idea of their perfect customer. And then they just make all their clothes to fit her. Megan is hired by different shops and their clothes are made to fit her like a glove. And if, like most people, you're buying bigger sizes, well, the clothes are still based around her original dimensions with inches simply added on all over to take them up each size. So if anyone can theoretically pick a size A off the rack and know it'll fit, it's Megan. What better way to test the consistency of high street sizing? We put it to the test with our very unscientific survey. We took her shopping and bought a few pairs of size 8 jeans from different shops. All of these jeans are a size 8, so let's go and see if they fit. So I'm just trying on the first pair of jeans. But I can already see that they are huge at the waistband. As I do them up, there's a good two inches. So the next pair that I'm trying on are very, very long. So even though I'm five foot eight, these jeans are way too long for me. So I'm putting on the next pair. They actually fit perfectly. Okay, so I'm putting on the last pair of jeans that we've got here. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get them over my bum. So this brand, I don't tend to go shopping in because it's designed to kind of fit teenagers. And I'm no longer a teenager. Look, I can barely do them up. And then they're going to dig in here, which is just, it's not very comfortable. So just remember, all of these jeans are a size 8 and have fitted me completely different. They're all size 8, all from the high street and I would have to go up or down in a couple of them. Unbelievable. Even our fit model, someone who is literally a size 8 for a living, couldn't guarantee that a size 8 picked off the rack would fit her. That's because those clothes weren't fitted on her, and they almost certainly weren't fitted on you either. So don't worry too much about the number in the label, and if it does bother you, just cut it out. Well, thank you, Beth, and thanks also to Megan Taylor and Dr Vicky Haffenden. That is all we have time for, but please keep your questions and your comments coming in to more or less at bbc.co.uk. Our Twitter handle is at BBC More or Less, and we also have a chart-topping podcast. Until next week, goodbye. More or Less was produced in partnership with The Open University. The presenter was Tim Harford, and the producer was Charlotte MacDonald. Jerry Lewis is the American comic who, with Dean Martin, found fame as one of the most successful double acts of all time. And, of course, Sir Bruce Forsyth, whose death a week ago has seen him fondly remembered for his contribution to British entertainment in a career spanning more than seven decades. They're both remembered in Last Word in a minute. That's after a couple of words from Jane Garvey, who's looking ahead to tomorrow. Bank Holiday Monday's edition of Women's Hour is in Margate with the broadcaster Gemma Kearney, former Apprentice winner Michelle Dubry and tech presenter Gia Milinovic. They're in Margate helping women feel better about their bodies by inventing a product or an activity that might help. Uh, swimsuits, mirrors, shouting and life drawing classes all in the mix. Women's Hour in Margate on Bank Holiday Monday morning just after 10. 
Now, cruising the high seas, how much longer will this kind of lifestyle be affordable in retirement? That's the starting point uh, for the death of retirement. That's at uh, nine o'clock this evening here on Radio 4. But first, it's time to join Kate Silverton. On Last Word this week, Brian Aldiss, the gifted science fiction author who inspired the Hollywood movie AI, Artificial Intelligence. Jerry Lewis, the American comic who, with Dean Martin, found fame as one of the most successful double acts of all time. Blanche Blackwell, the Jamaican society hostess who became Ian Fleming's lover and some believe the inspiration for the Bond movie character Pussy Galore. And Sir Bruce Forsyth, whose death a week ago today has seen him fondly remembered for his contribution to British entertainment in a career spanning more than seven decades. to see you, to see you now. But first, Abu Kifar has died in Syria at the age of just 25. He was shot in the head in an apparent execution. He was a volunteer with the White Helmets, a search and rescue team who risk their lives to save others in the brutal civil war that rages in the country. Funded in part by the UK and the US, the White Helmets have faced criticism in some quarters because of their perceived partiality in the complex politics of the region. Abu Kifar was from a poor Sunni Muslim family, working as a tailor until he joined the White Helmets. He said he simply wanted to help people. Last year, he made headlines around the world after footage emerged of him rescuing an eight-week-old baby, pulled alive from the bombed-out rubble of a house in the town where he himself had been born. His raw emotion and relief at having saved her life touched many people, including me. I was presenting the one o'clock news on the day the footage emerged. It's a year since Russian forces began airstrikes in Syria. Human rights observers estimate in that... Moaz Ashami, a Syrian journalist, was with Abu Kifar that day. On that day, there were so many air raids by the Russian aircraft and they hit that two-story house in the middle of Idlib and we picked out ten bodies they were all dead and then Abu Kifah could hear the screams of the baby but all that rubble was on top of the baby and it was very very difficult but Abu Kifah swore that he would not leave the area until he picked her out you know and after two hours two full hours they managed to bring her out alive with minor scratches because the roof was protected. <laughs> Abu Kifa picked up the baby girl, Wahida Matu, and he held her. So Abu Kifa was still holding on to the baby in the ambulance till we got to the hospital. And when we got there, there was the baby girl's father. He ran toward the ambulance. Her father saw her. Her father burst into tears because he thought he lost his whole family like he lost all his neighbors. You know, his baby girl, uh, her mother, and only one other neighbor were the only ones to come out alive. And in a flood of tears, his tears just did not stop. Abu Kifah refused to hand over Wahida to her father because when he saved her mother from the rubble of the house and she told him, promise me you're going to do your best to find my baby. And he told her that he promises her and he would only hand the baby to her and nobody else. And he wanted to keep his promise. So when we got to the hospital, he handed the baby to her mother just to keep his promise. And the father was in tears. And when I saw all of them crying, I joined in. I just couldn't stop my tears flowing. So I, I asked him, what made you cry so much? And he said, you know, I rescued hundreds of children, dozens and dozens of women and old men. But I just felt that this little baby 
was like my own daughter, my own little child, but also because her mother, when I rescued her mother, she was screaming for her baby because that was her only child. And she told me, save my baby and leave me under the rubble. He was a wonderful man, very brave man, who over about six years did his best throughout struggle and hard times to save lives and rescue children and babies. Abu Kafah may be gone, but his legacy lives on. It lives on in Wahida Matuk, the baby he saved. She's now just over a year old, but when she grows up, I'm sure her parents will tell her about the hero who saved her life. And she will grow up to tell other people about him. Abu Kufa died at the age of 25. So Bruce Joseph Forsyth Johnson died a week ago today at 89. He was a presenter, actor, comedian, singer, dancer and screenwriter with a career spanning 75 years. This week, all those who worked with him shared their memories of one of Britain's most enduring and best loved entertainers. His way of doing things was the way I wanted to do things, to be in charge of a show, not only with what you say and the way you say it, but here's a man who can be in charge with a roll of the eyes, a sideways glance, a grimace or a smile, a master not only of the catchphrase, but also the the. I knew Bruce wanted to be a movie star. That was his big ambition. I think he fancied being James Bond, but that was ridiculous. But if Roger Moore could do it, he could have done it. I'm a welder. You're a welder? Yeah. I know this. See, you two trying to build yourself. <laughs> Welcome to Have I Got News For You. For you, have I got... I'll be honest, I wasn't entirely sure it was a good idea. Why we're on the subject of a wreck... I mean, it was quite appalling. And if anyone else had done it, I would guess it would have been pulled. The audience will help you. I have to say, by the end of it, he had sort of stormed it. I'm not sure this program can go much lower. What Bruce talked about was, as a child, wanting to get out on those boards. When he would talk about discipline, he would talk about how hard you had to work and that you had to do what came along and, and prove that you could do it step by step by step by step. Eamon Holmes, Arlene Phillips, Sir Michael Parkinson and Ian Hislop, plus numerous others, have paid tribute to Sir Bruce this week. Jules Stenson, his biographer, says his drive for stardom began at an early age. He came from quite a middle-class family, Bruce. He, he grew up in, in Edmonton in North London. His dad was a garage owner, but they, were, they, were, they, were, they did quite well. They were wonderful parents, and, and probably my mother particularly had more ambition for me than I had myself. Bruce was not an overnight success. He left school and went straight on stage. But he then struggled for 16 years in the clubs, performing to small audiences, getting terrible reviews, being booed off stage. And he only really made it big when he was 30. It was hard. In fact, I did, I did one time, I gave myself five years. I thought, if I'm not going to make it within five years, I'm turned it in. Really? Yeah. So what happened then? What was the turning point at 30? He'd been booked for three or four years to just an entertainment show at Babacom Theatre in Devon. There may be trouble ahead. Why did they ask him? <laughs> of music and love and romance. He was going down a store and ITV were developing a new entertainment show called um, Sunday Night at the Palladium and they were looking for a host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sunday Night at the London Palladium. You know, he's on Sunday Night at the Palladium, the only competition is BBC One. You know, 15 million people were watching him every Sunday night. He was a huge star. So when did he come to the BBC? Bruce didn't come to the BBC until the Generation game in the early 70s. And the sheet gave you gifts of beads. Oh, really? A nice, yes. And you knew it was polite to give something in return. Oh, yes. Yeah. He then created his own one-man show. 
and he was working with some really high caliber people so the choreography for instance was done by bob fossey who won an oscar for cabaret and he saw this as his kind of launch pad to become a star like his hero sammy davis jr he wanted to be a song and dance man he wanted to be fred astaire you know he didn't want to be a game show host he was obviously a huge success as we've been discussing all week but you you seem to be suggesting that maybe he he was unfulfilled personally he was he was hugely unfulfilled personally all right throughout his career i mean there were some successes i mean bruce had some movie roles i mean he had lots of missed chances. For instance, right at the end of the 60s, Lionel Bart had seen his stage show and was looking to cast Fagin in the movie of the musical adaptation of Oliver. Ron Moody had done the stage show and was, um, but was, was unavailable for the movie. And then Moody did become available. Brucey lost out on the role, and the, the musical was one of the biggest successes of all time. And Bruce had loads of missed chances like that, where you know he could have become that kind of Fred Astaire that he'd always wanted to be. I heard an interview with Sir Michael Parkinson just after the news was announced of uh, Sir Bruce's death, and he reflected on his friend and his ambitions. And I heard that same hint that he had talked about going to America and Michael said, I said to him, why bother? You're great here, your household name here. Why bother going to America? Because that was a disappointing move for him, wasn't it? Bruce launched a one-man show on Broadway in 1978-79, just after he'd finished the Generation Game the first time. And he bought the show over. It was very similar to his one-man show in the 60s, lots of costume changes, lots of comedy, singing and dancing. And he booked a theatre for one week in Broadway. And, of course, all the, the American critics, New York Times... Um, incredibly powerful came to see the show and basically hated it i remember the new york daily news said the britain is not fitting that one review essentially closed the show and he kind of lost his chance again live from london this is strictly come dancing and i do wonder if it did help satiate him in some way the song and dance ambition that he had that he was holding center stage back there again on the bbc with a, a family show but a dance show I, i'm kind of hoping you'll just say yes bruce was by then in his 70s he loved the fact that he was on the biggest show on tv he loved the fact that he was attracting a huge audience but he actually didn't particularly enjoy the actual making of Strictly. He felt that, that there was a limited interaction with the contestants. What viewers of Strictly probably don't realise is that Bruce was his own warm-up man. He would come out before the cameras were rolling and do 20 minutes of song and dance just to get everyone in the move and get that lovely sort of feel-good atmosphere that you, you see on TV when the show goes out. But he said in one of his la very last interviews, he said that he found um, presenting Strictly, quote, lonely. And I think the loneliness came from the fact that, that he was really, you know, just uh, just a presenter and, 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 and not a performer. What do you think he would have considered his biggest success then? He would consider his biggest success his one-man show in the 60s. And Bruce loved the fact that he was Mr Saturday Night in the 70s, and he particularly loved that he was Mr Saturday Night in the noughties with Strictly. He kind of recreated that dominance over the opposition, which he always loved. Sir Bruce Forsyth, who's died at 89. Brian Aldiss was one of Britain's leading science fiction writers. He came to prominence in the 60s, the author of a short story bought by Stanley Kubrick and later made into the Hollywood film AI, Artificial Intelligence. The story's about a boy who doesn't realise he's an android, but is aware that his mother doesn't quite love him, and he's unsure why. It was inspired by his own deeply unhappy childhood. He recalled being badly beaten by his father and rejected by his mother after the death of his baby sister. He was sent to boarding school at just six years old where he faced brutal bullying and intense loneliness. His work was often suffused with emotional depth and psychological insight. Writer and collaborator David Wingrove says more people should be reading him. I think he's one of the great undiscovereds. I'd say there are probably in a collection of Brian Aldiss stories, uh, there's probably about 20, 25 novels which you would probably enjoy. Tell me about when you very first started writing. How old were you? Four. 
I believe that they were highly imaginative. He entered imaginary worlds with his sister, and his writing, he said, allowed him to confront the demons and insecurities from his past that had pursued him into adulthood. Science fiction writer Neil Gaiman and Brian's daughter Wendy Aldis take up the story. When he was very young and his sister, his younger sister Betty, was uh, uh, able to join in, he was venture boy and she was venture girl and he would invent worlds. And once he discovered certain stories in things like Modern Boy and then later Astounding, those worlds became space-based. One of the things that Brian held on to through all his work was a sense of, of wonder, that childhood mm. sense of wonder, which may actually have been the thing that led him into science fiction. I don't agree with those people who think that science fiction is some kind of prediction of the future. It may or it may not be. I think it's a metaphor, and it's a metaphor for the human condition. This is how Yuli, son of Aelhor, came to a place called Old Arando where his descendants flourished in the better days that were to come. With Heliconia, he actually hit an idea that was big enough that it had to be told in three big books. Yuli was seven years old, virtually a grown man, when he crouched under a skin bivouac with his father and gazed down the wilderness of a land known even at that time as Camberland. Set thousands of years apart and you get to watch a world coming out of winter uh, you get to watch this incredibly complex biological system they're being observed by watchers from the earth a spaceship called the Avernus is going around the planet and observing them but while the story is going on you realize it's long enough that terrible things happen on Earth, the terrible things happen on the spaceship, and yet it's just one year in the cycle of Heliconia, and that's his masterpiece. He becomes a science fiction writer, but then I think he realizes that that's not what he wants to be. He wants to be a writer. And so he writes books like Barefoot in the Head, Report on Probability A, both of which are very experimental, avant-garde books. You'd, you'd think, if you read it, that this was actually something that James Joyce had cast off. He wrote every kind of science fiction that you could possibly write, and a number of experimental things that weren't. He wrote memoirs, he wrote an astonishing survey and history of the science fiction field. I was in my study, and uh, the phone rang. It was Stanley Kubrick, and he talked and talked and talked and talked. Wendy, tell me about the experience that he had then when Stanley Kubrick first bought his short story, Super Toys, last all summer long, which would become the film AI, Artificial Intelligence. Well, he was a real fan of Stanley Kubrick, and so he was fascinated, and he spent some time going and working with Kubrick. I said, you could never make this into a big movie. And Stanley said, oh, yes, I could. And we were both wrong, you see. He couldn't. Stanley died. But Spielberg could. In a distant future, in an age of intelligent machines, he is the first robotic child programmed to love. It's a little bit too upbeat for Brian. I mean, one of the things that, that runs through all of Brian's work is a healthy and good-natured streak of pessimism which is one of the things that makes it so English. How will you remember him, Neil? I will remember a tall, genial, incredibly brilliant person who made no attempt to wear his intelligence proudly. He wore it lightly, but you always felt that it was there. And he had a wicked sense of humour that was absolutely enduring. And by wicked, she means wicked. <laughs> he always knew when he had gone too far, and he would always go just beyond that. Brian Aldis, who's died at the age of 92. 
Blanche Blackwell, who's died aged 104, was a Jamaican heiress, the last of a bygone age when just 20 families ran Jamaica and when the tropical paradise became the playground of the rich and famous. She became the go-to hostess, close friend and muse of Noel Coward and later mistress of Ian Fleming, some claiming she was the woman who inspired his Bond character, Pussy Galore. Her sharp wit and intelligence beguiled the visitors to her home, including the man she described as the most handsome she'd ever seen, Errol Flynn. The writer Andrew Lice had got to know Blanche whilst researching his biography on Fleming. Her family were kind of wealthy Jewish merchants and entrepreneurs on Jamaica. They had sugar, bananas, and they had the biggest rum distillery in, in Jamaica. She was just this extraordinary character. I, I, in some ways, I don't think I've ever met anybody quite like her, really. She had an amazing sort of composure about her, sort of very self-sufficient, <laughs> despite the fact that she was sort of waited on by lots of servants and that sort of thing because she lived in a very grand style. Her son, Chris Blackwell, founder of Island Records, remembers going to Fleming's home. My first time at GoldenEye, I came with my mother. The lunch was given by Ian Fleming. We had lunch actually right at the spot. So how did this meeting with Ian Fleming come about and what was it, do you think, that attracted her to him and him to her? Well, I think it was it was totally unexpected. He was initially probably a bit drunk, I imagine, but he was more than a bit rude to her. The first time I met him, he came up to me and said, I hope you're not a lesbian. And I was kissed rather passionately. The basis of their friendship and in later their love affair was particularly that they both loved to, to swim. I had to hold on to his feet <laughs> so that the tide didn't take him away. He was full of query. You could see him observing everything. He was just like a little boy, really. You're smiling as you make your recollections of her, and I, I see almost what I would imagine is the allure of her, even as you speak about her. There were many men who fell for her charms, Errol Flynn among them. Errol Flynn was definitely one of them. She told me how he had wanted to marry her. She told her mother about that, and uh, her mother was quite annoyed and said that, uh, you know, she should have taken up the offer. And uh, Blanche said to her mother, well, then, why don't you marry him then? <laughs> and what about Noel Cal then? What was that relationship? They clearly had a whale of the time. Is it um, true that Noel wrote the, the play Volcano about Ian and Blanche's relationship? Yeah, this was a play about a plantation owner who becomes miffed by the arrival of his lover's wife. She claimed she liked it, but she was always very loyal. She said, I adore men, and um, clearly she did, but she added to that, I treat them as pets. There were lots of people that I met down here who came to visit. Lots of actors, actresses, film directors, producers. And of her son, because it was her money, of course, that financed his business, which as a startup, it was. Obviously, he went on to become hugely successful. But was she proud of his achievement and indeed her part in it? She was incredibly proud of um, Christopher, her son. She was very proud of him and his achievements. And similarly, he was clearly very proud of her. Blanche Blackwell, who's died at the age of 104. Jerry Lewis brought happiness and fun to millions around the world, finding fame in a comedy act he formed with Dean Martin in the United States in the 50s. Theirs was a partnership that would enthrall and entertain in music halls and then the big screen, leading to them becoming perhaps the most successful double act in history. Lewis's skill was for more abstract art and social satire, something Americans didn't always take to, especially after he pursued a solo career in the 60s. His popularity dwindled until he was adopted by other nationalities, notably France and the UK, who saw him not just as a comic idiot, but as a thinker and innovator. Martin Scorsese helped restart his career in America when he cast him in a straight role, ironically in a film called The King of Comedy. Sean Levy, his biographer, shared his recollections of a clever but complex man and begins with how Jerry Lewis got his first big break. 
he was performing at a nightclub in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and bombing. And Jerry remembered a singer who he had once worked with in New York that he had had a good rapport with, a fellow named Dean Martin. If you still kiss, you're going to wear the garlic and oil. That's a more That's a more Martin was also a struggling nobody, and literally overnight, these guys were a hit. She was, thanks a lot, you saved my life. That's all right, forget it. No, I won't forget it. Forget it. I won't forget it. I said forget it. All right, I'll forget it. And for 10 years, they were as big an act as show business has ever seen. And then what happened? Well, after about 10 years, there was some acrimony between them. And in 1956, almost 10 years to the week, after their first performances in Atlantic City, they broke up. Jerry Lewis then, after that partnership broke up, he went to perform on his own. He wrote, directed, he starred in his own films. Was he well received then as a solo artist? He was not well received in the United States. I think he wore out his welcome, I think, for, the, for among, the, among the critical press. The people on our Love Network do a fantastic job raising dollars on the local level. He was celebrated for raising vast funds for muscular dystrophy, wasn't he? Was there a personal connection there? He got involved in, in muscular dystrophy in the 1950s because he had an associate who lost a nephew to a, a particularly virulent form of neuromuscular disease. And he started doing work regularly in the 50s. He started his telephones, and he did those until 2011 or so. And in that time, in those 45 years, just on the telephone, he raised close to two billion dollars. And is that that work was what he received the humanitarian award for in two thousand and nine? Yes, yes, yeah. Well, well deserved and very late. Robert De Niro, Jerry Lewis, in a Martin Scorsese picture, the King of Comedy. And just finally, that we haven't spoken about the Martin Scorsese role, because that was sort of paradoxical in some ways, wasn't it? That he was, uh, his career was revived in, what, 1982 in The King of Comedy, but in a straight role. Yeah, he plays um, a talk show host named Jerry Langford, who is very like Jerry Lewis. Now, I know it's an old hackneyed expression, but it happens to be the truth. You've got to start at the bottom. I know, that's where I am, at the bottom. Jerry wore his own clothes. We see Jerry's house twice in the film, um, a Manhattan house and a Long Island house. They're filled with knickknacks from Jerry's actual home, including Jerry's dog. Do you think he would have looked back on his career as a success, given that maybe he didn't have that affirmation and recognition that he might have expected and, as you say, deserved for um, a career with such longevity? I think toward the very end of his career, perhaps in the last 10 years, there was finally a softening and that Jerry could you know, enjoy the company of not only his colleagues, but of younger generations, comedians who grew up watching him. So people like Steve Martin, Martin Short, Robin Williams, Jim Carrey, who's practically doing Jerry in his first half dozen films. So even though he didn't get an Oscar for acting, I think I think toward the end of his life he really did uh, feel like uh, unappreciated, like 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 people had seen his talent. Jerry Lewis, who's died at 91. This week you also heard last words on Abu Kifa, Brian Aldiss, Blanche Blackwell, and Sir Bruce Forsyth. Don't forget this program is available as a podcast. Look for us online or search your podcast app for BBC Last Word. Last Word was presented by Kate Silverton and produced by Neil George. Pensioners retiring today are described as a fortunate generation. Many have benefited from generous workplace pensions, the ability to buy their own homes and soaring property values. Future generations may not be so lucky. In the final programme of our series, which looks at whether retirement as we know it is dead, we'll be asking whether tomorrow's pensioners will be able to afford a 20-year paid holiday at the end of their lives. If not, what are their options? The death of retirement is in a couple of minutes. A history of social housing. So Liverpool was the first to recognise a link between housing and public health. Yes, definitely. I mean, that was the crucial change really that happened here. From Victorian model villages to modern day developments. In the 
early 70s, council homes were, were desirable, very desirable. You had central heating, the toilet was indoors, they had fitted showers. It almost felt like a new kind of living. Streets Apart, a history of social housing on BBC Radio 4 this Monday to Friday at 1.45. BBC News at 9 o'clock. Emergency workers in Texas have rescued nearly 2,000 people from rising floodwaters in and around the city of Houston as Tropical Storm Harvey continues to batter the state. The U.S. National Weather Service has described conditions as unprecedented and beyond anything experienced. About 250 roads have been closed and hundreds of thousands of people are without power. The governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, told a news conference that 3,000 members of the National Guard had been mobilized to help. Parts of those regions will continue to receive incredibly heavy rain that will lead to even more flooding and more danger for Texans. Texans need to be prepared for more rainfall tonight, on occasion very heavy rainfall. Two lorry drivers have been charged with causing death by dangerous driving in the M1 crash, which killed eight people and left four others with serious injuries. An IT services company, Wipro, said three of its employees were among those who died near Newport Pagnell yesterday morning. People have been warned to stay away from beaches on the East Sussex coast and to keep doors and windows closed after a suspected chemical leak. Sussex police said there was an unknown haze coming in from the sea. Up to 50 people complained of irritation to their eyes and throats on the beach at Berlin Gap near Eastbourne. Officials in Afghanistan say a car bomb attack in the southern province of Helmand has killed at least 13 people. A provincial government spokesman said 19 others were injured by the explosion, which targeted a convoy of Afghan soldiers. Jeremy Corbyn has defended Labour's new policy of remaining in the EU single market and customs union for a transitional period after Brexit, saying it would be better for the economy and for British workers. The shift would mean accepting the free movement of Labour and continuing membership payments after Britain leaves the EU in March 2019. BBC News. In half an hour, Matthew Gwyther will be asking whether privately run prisons have fulfilled their promise to deliver a cost-effective, safe and reliable prison service. That's in In Business, a half past nine here on Radio 4. But first, it's the final programme in the Moneybox series, The Death of Retirement. Adam Shaw is asking how much is enough for a comfortable retirement. Ah. So champagne on ice? Absolutely. If you book a suite, champagne on arrival, your butler will also come and introduce himself to you. What does a butler do? And all of the cabins have 24-hour room service, so that's as well. I'm just going to take the weight off my feet and put my legs up on my lovely corner sofa here. I am lounging in my luxury suite aboard the Saga Sapphire. 720 passengers, 415 crew are just about to start a 14-night cruise of the Baltics. The problem is this cruise alone costs between three and a half and seven thousand pounds. If I'm going to afford this life, it's something that's got to be planned or saved for. So just how much do we need to live the kind of retirement we want? The consumer group, which, asked around two and a half thousand members how much they needed to retire into this sort of lifestyle. On average, couples living so-called luxury retirements were spending £39,000 a year. So, if that's what we need to spend, how much do we need to save so we can afford it? David Finch is a senior economic analyst from the Resolution Foundation think tank. The standard measure that most people talk about is the replacement rate, and that's the proportion of income you need in retirement as a share of your income before retirement. For the typical earner, that's around 67%, around two-thirds of your income. And it's slightly lower because you don't have some additional costs that most people would think of having through their working life, so things like the cost of going to work, um, the cost of raising children, and the kind of cost of paying your mortgage on your home. So, if that's what most experts see as the basic benchmark, how near that target are we? Alistair McQueen, Head of Savings and Retirement at the financial services firm Aviva. 
the generation that are retiring today is a fortunate generation that benefited from these generous final salary pensions which in many situations are delivering them the level of income that they aspire to in retirement. For the younger generation who are not benefiting from those gold-plated benefits, this is a generation that needs support and guidance and encouragement to make sure that they do not enter retirement with a huge shock and say, my parents retired like that, why am I not retiring like this? One of the reasons we may not be saving enough is that we're living much longer. Whatever pension pot we have is therefore having to sustain us over many more years of retirement. Stephen Kane rejoices in the title of Senior Mortality Consultant with the financial group Willis Towers Watson. Since the mid-19th century, life expectancy around the globe has increased by about two and a half years a decade. And we've seen similar increases in the UK. More recently, we've seen really a stalling in the increase in longevity. It's still going up, but it's going much more slowly. Any idea why that might be? There have been quite a large number of um, deaths in a couple of winters recently, one of which was attributed to a, a flu vaccine that wasn't very effective. We've also had more recently the first year where dementia and Alzheimer's has become the leading cause of death in the UK. So dementia and Alzheimer's since the year 2000 has tripled in terms of being a, a cause of death. And circulatory disease used to be the largest killer in the country. That has now almost halved since the year 2000. The rate of increase in life expectancy is slowing. Do you think we have reached peak age? There was a, a, a rather public spat about this recently between different scientists in the journal Nature about whether or not 115 was the limit on life. And one scientist argued it was because of the way they'd interpreted the data. Another bunch of scientists disagreed. You can reach very different conclusions based on different ways of looking at the same information. Increased longevity doesn't just affect individuals trying to financially plan their way through their retirement. It also affects company and private pension schemes. For every one-year change in life expectancy at age 65, the amount these schemes have to pay out goes up by around 4%. It's no wonder life expectancy is something the industry is obsessed with. Increasing costs for individuals and companies is clearly a challenge, and some believe the way round it is to think of the whole concept of retirement quite differently. I wonder if any of us are going to retire. I wonder if actually what we should be thinking about is not work as a way of producing enough money to buy a pension, but rather work allowing us to build the intangible assets, productivity, vitality, transformational skills that will help us to continue to work right through our lives. Linda Gratton is a professor of management practice at London Business School and co-author of the 100-year life, living and working in an age of longevity. I would invite you to think about what would you like your working life to look like? Why would you take all your holidays, i.e. retirement at the end? Why wouldn't you want to take that right the way through? I mean, why should only 18-year-olds take a gap year? Why wouldn't you take a gap year when you're 40 or 60 or 80? Why wouldn't you want to start your own business in your 50s? We have to completely rethink the way that we live all of our lives. Living to 100 isn't just about the last 20 years of life, it's actually about the redesign of all of life. Brooke Elias graduated last year. Paul Lewis spoke to her back in the first of our programmes in this series about the death of retirement. I'm 23. I work at a student's union at Bournemouth University as a sabbatical officer and I don't honestly know a lot about pensions. I met up with Brooke Elias on Bournemouth Beach and talked to her about the sort of retirement she might be able to afford. Do you know how much you're contributing, how much the employer is contributing? So I looked it up. Um, I'm paying about just over £12 a month and I think that works out about 1% and then my employer is paying the same. How much do you spend on alcohol, do you reckon, per month? Uh, a lot more than that. <laughs> okay. Now, there is a man called Alistair at a big insurance company and pensions company called Aviva who's been looking into some of your numbers for you, who is at the other end of a telephone. Shall we give him a call? Go for it. 
Hi, it's Brooke. Hello, Brooke. Now, you have very kindly looked into Brooke's numbers for us. Can you just tell yeah. us roughly what you have found? Now, you've told me that you're saving, a, here's some approximation, so you're saving about £15 a month into your pension. Yeah. Um, you benefit from money coming from your employer. You also benefit from money coming from the tax man. And you benefit because your money is growing, it's investing over time. By the time you reach retirement, your pension is going to be worth about £40,000. Now, Alistair, that sounds a lot of money. You already look much more comfortable, <laughs> don't you? But that has got to last an awful long time. What sort of estimates are you making about how long Brooke is going to live for? Your life expectancy is to reach the age of 91. Straight away, you're going to see that your £40,000 is going to have to last you quite a long time. A £1,000 a year to live off? Yeah, I think that's kind of the figure that you're looking at. However, the government will also give you the state pension when you reach retirement. Now, that's going to be, for somebody like yourself, around about £8,000 a year. So if you were to continue in your current trend, with your current salary, saving your current £15 a month, a loose indication is about £9,000 a year would be your income when you reach retirement. Okay. And do you think that's enough for someone to live a reasonable standard of living? A good target for most of us is to try and reach an income in retirement that's equivalent to about 60% of our salary. And for some of you, if your income at the moment that would be about £12,000 a year. How much does she have to boost her contributions to from yeah. her current 1% of salary? I think, Brooke, an indication for you is to increase your saving from about 1% up to 4%. Now, that's boosting your contribution from about 12, say, £15 a month up to about £50 a month. When I hear, like, £50, to me, that is, you know, what I could spend on going out with friends or I'm trying to save to go away traveling and stuff. If you were to wait until you were 30 before beginning this savings challenge, you'd be saving about £80 every month. If you were to wait until you were 40 before starting this saving challenge, you need to save about £130 a month. If you didn't wait, if you waited until you were 50, it'd be £200 a month. So the hill will only get steeper if you wait longer before saving. To be fair, that does make me want to start doing it now. This is a, an important conversation we just had. 100%. Alistair, your work here is done. Great. Thank you so much. Like Brooke Elias, we can all help ourselves by saving more. In fact, there is some good news. More people are now saving into a pension thanks to automatic enrolment. About 8 million more people. Since 2012, this has made it compulsory for employers to enrol their staff into a pension scheme. Although it's still being rolled out, opt-out levels are much lower than expected. So, are our savings adequate to fund our spending plans? A question that David Finch from the Resolution Foundation think tank has been wrestling with for a report for the Intergenerational Commission. We're actually seeing replacement rates rising slightly for the most recent cohorts entering retirement, and that's not including their earnings. This is purely on their kind of um, once they've retired and what their income is. But one risk is that increase may not be about pension income rising, but the pay squeeze that people have experienced in the years up to retirement. And then we can kind of throw that into the longer term as well, where younger cohorts entering the labour market today are doing so at lower levels of pay than the generations that came before them. And if that is the situation that continues throughout their working life, they're going to have a lower income over their lifetime. They may hit that replacement rate, but that income will mean on an income basis they're in a worse position than the pensioners that retired before them. It's not particularly cheering that the reason we may be able to save the right proportion of income for our retirement is only because the level of income is falling. So even the good news isn't really all that good, and it looks like it might get worse. If we look at the millennial generation coming through, one big issue for them is the proportion that are owning their own home. So around only 40% own their own home at the age of 30, compared to kind of 60% of the baby boomer generation. So when they hit retirement, as seems ever increasingly unlikely that they will be able to kind of really ramp up that home ownership, then, you know, if they are buying their home, they'll probably have some additional costs at retirement. So you're not so worried now 
you are more worried about how this situation is going to develop over the coming decades. That's right. And what is good there is that we are actually seeing government policy take some effect, at least on the pension side. We've had auto enrolments coming out over the last four years, and there's been a really quite startling uptick in the number of people now saving privately. And actually, what is encouraging is that the biggest increases have been amongst the lowest paid um, and also among women. They're groups who traditionally would undersave. But I think the big concern is then, are they going to save enough? And will their kind of target based on current outcomes be enough for people um, in 40 years' time? Even if you're not too worried about the situation for the cohort retiring now, that's just an average. Within that average, there must be individual groups who are suffering more than others. We tend to have a more generous state system for pensioners than for people of working age. And so when you come from very low earnings into a, the kind of state scheme, actually, you're doing potentially better than someone coming from a kind of typical rate because it's just a greater share of your earnings. But the majority of people will need to save privately and there are groups at risk of not doing so. One of those is the lowest paid and the ability for them to actually put enough in to make a significant saving. But there are other groups like the self-employed who aren't really covered at all, so they tend to not save privately. There's been an increase in the number of self-employed people since the downturn and that seems set to stay. One millennial who has already managed to get on the housing ladder is Laura Walker. We first met her and her toddler Daniel in Wakefield during our programme about workplace pensions. If you work for two, three, four companies within the space of quite a short period of time, which isn't that uncommon, you can end up with a lot of very small pension pots. So I'm, I'm currently in a position where I have three and none of them are really retirable on. And at the moment, I've not found a, a way that would be able to combine them or to put them together in any kind of meaningful way. As well as those pensions accumulated via auto-enrolment and property, Laura Walker has also benefited from an inheritance. So what type of retirement might she be able to afford? Over again to Alistair McQueen. There's a headline message here of good news for Laura. She's already amassed a pension pot of about £47,000 and she's also got property that she's got ownership of. So together those things put in a good place. Let's say you maintain your currently salary growing in line with inflation and you continue to contribute your current I think 2% and your employer puts your 4% in. If that's where we rolled forward from between now and retirement, your £47,000 today would grow to about, give or take, £150,000. You could expect to live to about the age of 90. That would give you an income, a private pension income of, of about £3,000 a year. Strikes me as shockingly small for a rather substantial sum of money. Laura's nodding her head in agreement. We both think this is shockingly small. I mean, £3,000 is not enough for a comfortable retirement, surely? I've never really seen my pension as something that I'm relying on for retirement. So I'd be looking at property incomes to give me a sort of everyday income and then look at a pension as sort of like extra cash, not really something that I'm planning to live off. What we must then now bring onto the table is a state pension that we all benefit from by making national insurance contributions. Do you honestly think life? that with this sort of exploding baby boomer population that the state pension is still going to exist by the time I retire in 2060 or whatever it is? Uh, who can predict the future? I believe it's going to be there. I think the government recognises there needs to be some foundation. I think it then puts great focus back on your private assets, your private savings and your private property. Given how across your finances you are, have you worked out how much you want or need a year in retirement? If I had about the income level that I've got at the, at the moment, which is about sort of £1,500 a month, that I could live quite a comfortable retirement because I'd have, I'd probably have my mortgage paid off by this point. So um, it's about £18,000 a year. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And it, this pension, at best, would provide you three. Yeah. So we're well short of where you want to be. Can you give us an idea of what she would need to do to mm. reach her target of £18,000 a year? What many people would say is that whatever your income is, aim to have about 60% of that in retirement. Now, if your income is £21,000 a year, we're talking there about £13,000. Oh, that would be fine. Is there any way she can achieve that, you think? Again, let's say we're taking, let's, Laura's asking us to take £8,000 of the state off the table. Right. If Laura is willing to retire at the age of 
68, not 65. I estimate that she would have about £3,000 from her pension savings, and I estimate that her property could generate another about £6,000 a year of income. So we're talking, we're up to now, we're now getting towards nine, maybe £10,000 a year. Alistair, I mean, clearly, uh, Laura, to some extent, has been lucky with an inheritance financially anyway, but also she's really across this subject. Laura is a shining light to her generation. But no matter how prepared you think you are, you can never predict with certainty what spending you'll need to make in retirement. Take social care. The real problem is not just that the cost is rising quickly, it's that we can't predict who will need the care. So it's impossible to properly plan. Developments in creating an approach that uses more than just statistics to more accurately predict life expectancy may help us plan better for this great unknown. Stephen Kane from Willis Towers Watson again. Postcode is a very good proxy because of the, the nature of what postcode means in terms of wealth and, and well-being. So I'm assuming you live in a better area, you tend to live longer. Yes, you do. So we've done some analysis of what, what the best and worst postal areas are. And the best postal area is Kingston upon Thames, with a life expectancy at age 65 of nearly 25 years. The worst area is Sunderland, unfortunately, with, with a life expectancy at age 65 of 22 and a half years. So there's a differential area of over two years. In Kingston upon Thames, you're expected to live till 90. In Sunderland, I think it was 87 and a half. Yes. Uh, how far off are we from an individual life expectancy data being available? So an example of that is a medical mortality.